I'm presenting the research that the Reading Web team is doing on Q2. Uh, we're trying to make uh, a partially based uh, prototype that makes uh, Wikipedia really, really fast and lean so that we can load. Uh, the, the main objective would be to load Barack Obama under 15 seconds in 2G. Um, so uh, it's in progress right now. We have a server that does all the aggregation and, and stripping from Parsoid, the same thing that the apps folks are doing in Android. And we have a, an HTML only version so that the people with really slow connections would be able to load the page. Uh, right now, we just we for the HTML only we have the elite section with a read more link and that loads the full article. Um, so this is the the web app, but it does the same thing. It works on HTML only. Um, so also we are adding now the client side part. Um, so we are adding the client side part. So when the page loads and we load the assets, we will be able to cache from then on all the content and do all the routing on the client. So you can see that I'm here. This is the with the client side version working right now. Uh, so if I go somewhere else, uh, the navigation is instant. It doesn't need to go. It goes through the API, but the Chrome is always there. It never leaves. And we can add caching on the client, as, I, as I've shown before in, with another prototype. So everything's there already. It's fast. And if you're in a slow connection, that really matters. You can go back and forth, forwards. And another thing that, I, that I'm adding now is client-side caching via database. So you can leave the page and come back, and the article will be there. You don't actually go to the server for anything if the article, you, if you already visited the article. So if I'm on Facebook, I'm going to reload. This is my local version. Um, and I go to the social networking service. As you saw, there's no transition. I'm going to reload again. Uh, if I come here, the article's cached because I already saw it, and and it's instant. It didn't go to the server. That means we can cache, save the articles for offline reading on the web. And once we implement service worker or app cache, we will have an offline web Wikipedia uh, for reading. Uh, there's still a lot more to do. So this is most of it. Uh, I think we can move on to questions for the rest of the minutes. Uh, I'm just going to keep doing that if you don't say anything. What's next for the prototype? Is this something that we're looking to implement as an infrastructure? Is something that's going to graduate to a feature? How are we envisioning this? So right now we're trying to solve the, the hardest problems. One was server-side rendering so that if you don't get the JavaScript or anything like that, you can work with the HTML only version. Next, we're adding the caching so that you can cache data on the client and have the offline version of the articles. And the next thing we're going to do is service worker so that you can have the offline web app. Like once you visit Wikipedia, you don't, the only thing is doing an API hit if the article you don't have it in locally. Otherwise, it wouldn't go to the server for anything. You have the Chrome, the assets, and your cached offline articles. And after that, when once uh, once all of that is working, there's some things we need to figure out, like uh, all the style sheets that are loaded. Right now, we have really bare bones styles, and they work most of the time. But there are some places where they don't work uh, very well. And there's also some feature parity with mobile web. I think we have that on the goal, so we have to add search and section collapsing and things like that. And then there's like measuring actually measuring these against the normal website and seeing how it does in really slow connections. I've done some tests. And so the lead section is super fast, as you can imagine. Uh, if, you go to, uh, if you go to a full article, we're doing stripping and all of that. It really makes a difference not loading images. We're not loading images right now. We're going to do lazy loading in a bit. So not loading images and stripping a lot of the content, that's a really great uh, difference. I've seen like two seconds on 2G for the Facebook article, for example. And in the normal side, it's, I don't know, like 30 seconds. Uh, but yeah, the, we need to do more measuring, like more rigorous measuring of all these things. And 
Right now we're doing the lead section separation between the lead section and the full content. And that's something we've done because right now it makes sense. But uh, auto-loading the rest of the content or loading per section, there's a lot of strategies we need to discuss too of what makes more sense for slow networks uh, and for a better experience for users. So it's basically uncovering questions and strategies so that we can talk about them uh, during this and afterwards in the Dev Summit. Uh, we're going to expose all of them and all the questions, and we hope to have good conversations around that. That's great. Great. Right. Really yeah. yeah, thank you. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, such a big step. All right, uh, Dimitri, are you ready? Hey, yes, I think so. Let me switch over here. Wait, show us some VR. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, in some of my 10% time, I've been revisiting the Wikipedia Lite app. Um, if you recall, I presented the beginnings of this at the hackathon in France, and I've just been slowly adding things here and there, and most recently, I just rebased the whole thing onto the current structure of our content service uh, and the current structure of the main app on which the Lite app is based. So, once again, the, um, the pitch of the Wikipedia Lite app is the fact that it renders the entire article without a web view at all. In other words, using only native Android text view components. One of the goals of this is to achieve sort of the maximum possible native performance in rendering the article and allow these really fast and smooth interactions with articles. So, like, the the time to first draw literally just becomes the network latency time that it takes to retrieve the content. And it only makes one request to get the content, so that's physically the fastest it can be. So this would position the app to uh, be really suitable for lower-end devices, underpowered devices that are pretty prevalent in Global South. Uh, and the other thing is, forcing ourselves to think about native rendering of the article will lead to ideas about how to better integrate the content with other features of the operating system. So, here, let's look something up. Everything else is the same as it is in the main app, except right now you're looking at a fully native rendering of the article. There's no web view. Um, we have sections and images rendered natively. Uh, for now, I'm kind of like rendering the article based on these card-shaped structure, just to reflect the structure that the content service gives us the article in. That's kind of why I'm doing that. The content service is doing a better and better job of segmenting the article into discrete chunks and formatting the all the metadata of the article in a way that makes it really easy for the app to consume. So here you can see we're getting a fuller resolution version of images based on the content service. Um, so anyway, yeah, this, this kind of thing makes it really easy to start augmenting content with interactions that make sense for a mobile device. So like a couple of examples I can think of. What if uh, next to each paragraph, you had a little button that allowed you to like bring up a menu where you can share content at the art or at the paragraph level, not just the section or the article. Eventually, we could even make it at the sentence level. We could share content that way. Uh, what if at the end of each section we could insert a card that says, "Would you like to read more about so and so?" We could pull in a random link from the previous section and expose a snippet of content from that or an image gallery from it. Uh, we could insert a card that has a quick survey with a number of buttons or a donate button, anything we want. Uh, another thing that I did actually prototype already is if we go to an article that has a geo location, that will be a good one. Okay, you can get a native card that has a, a live map tile. And of course, this is an interactive, interactive maps tile. 
So a whole lot of possibilities with this. This is just scratching the surface. Of course, there will be a lot more work that would need to be done with this, specifically uh, with more complicated HTML content, like tables. But with things like Parsoid, uh, we would be able to take tables from Wikitext and structure them in a way that lets the app present it the way that it needs to. But anyway, that's pretty much what I got so far. Wikipedia Lite app. That's cool. Dimitri, how does this, how does this, the, the back end that you're consuming work, uh, I guess, conceptually with Joaquin's work? Like, it feels like they're very similar. Yeah, I suppose it is similar in the sense that it's, uh, well, Joaquin, are you using the content service the same way that this is using? Uh, we're doing something similar. We're not at that stage. Uh, I think with Bernd last week, we had a lot of notes I sent an email. Uh, so we are aware that we're going to have uh, shared transformations, and we're, we're trying to find a strategy for sharing all these, this code, uh, which is definitely it's going to be useful to be working on the same kind of services. Yeah, so I kind of like see this converging onto a common purpose, uh, except you know, with, with the Light app, it's really trying to be even more, I don't know, in touch with the, the native operating system as much as possible. Dimitri, why couldn't we do this in the main Android app? Well, the reason we can't do this right now, uh, like which part are you referring to? Um, all the sections as native sections. Oh, well, yeah, because a lot of articles contain much more complex HTML, like math formulas and tables and lists, things that don't really render well yet in native components. Is there a way to render all the text natively and all the more complicated HTML in the web view? Well, yeah, we could do that, uh, but then that would negate the idea of not having a web view at all. Or are you talking like render as much text as we can and then optionally allow users to view it in a web view <laughs> at a different sort of display? It's tricky, too, because sometimes these things are interleaved, like the math formulas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot still to think about with this, but I, I just want to like push forward with the concept that this this is possible to do natively. No, and I think that's ex I think that's exactly right, and I, I think it's great to see the work on the back end, or I guess the middle tier that Joaquin and the web team are are leading. Um, line up with this kind of work. Like it's definitely like it feels like. Like it's hard to justify an architecture without a without a use case. When we've tried to do things on the back end, like Wikipedia Light App, it's just we've just kind of things have gotten really complicated really quickly. So I think this is like from my perspective, this is a really cool arc. Okay, it looks like Moise is up next. All right. Just a just a second here. Sure. I have to kind of toggle present, stop, present, present. That's it. Okay. I mean, I don't have much to say. But should I? Okay. Sorry. 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 Hang on. Yeah. 30, 30. I know. Yeah. <laughs> this is the worst. Okay, we're we're good. I I'm going to be showing a screen from Garrett. <laughs> 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 I'm not kidding. I am not. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, just a quick, just a quick update uh, on the portal stuff. So, so we have now been successful uh, in moving the portal. From Meta to to Garrett or Git, uh, and uh, you know, and, uh, and like you know, the entire team worked on this. Uh, 
Julian, Jan, Max, Kevin, uh, everybody else, you know, that I'm not naming. Um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, the reason why I'm saying this, uh, and, it's, and it doesn't look exciting, but it, but it is pretty cool because uh, there was a lot of community work in the background. Uh, there, was, there was not that much technical work, but, but it was still, it's still a significant step for us to, to go that route to make any more improvements on portal. So for example, today we are scheduled to, to put in the event logging for the first time in, on the Wikipedia.org portal page. So from so for the next uh, so today we're going to launch that and then the, the rest of the week we're going to be uh, you know measuring our our very first baselines right like how many people do whatever on that page right and then the next week uh, we are scheduled to to launch our first uh, like you know A/B test and the first A/B test is not that big but it's still a first and it's still a, it's still a big step so I just wanted to like give that a shout out to you. that's all cool thank you. Exciting, right, Gary? You, yeah. you, you can all commit to that to that very project now. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, anybody have questions? So, yeah, is it so? Is it is this just holding the content there? Is this actually now an extension? Like we have a portal extension, or Julian, can you speak to that? It's, it's just the content. Basically, yeah. the HTML and the CSS and JS was stored in a wiki template, and now it's stored in a Git repository. Now we're doing incremental updates. Uh, we improve the performance, and then later to have data learning and to do the CV test. Just an iterate on that. So the HTML does have the content of the page, but, um, but the content is not that much, right? It's just like links and like, you know, like numbers of like how many articles there are in different languages that we show, right? It's not that much content on that HTML page. But it was previously housed on Meta, but now it's not housed on Meta. And, and what do you, so do you, does this sort of ride the release train and go, you have a version that goes out with government that data or whatever you, or do sure, you yeah, in the future, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right now, I think we are like breaking the release, release chain right now because, you know, we just wanted to like push some stuff. But uh, yeah, in the future, for sure. there's no there's no static content for it. There's just there's just the, the numbers of articles come automatically. Right? Not from well, currently it's all uh, manually generated. We are working on uh, scripts to build the entire HTML manually. We're uh, not automatically doing that. That's part of the build system. Okay, cool. Uh, suppose that we wanted to build like an installable web app. Does this repo give us access to that sort of thing? Like we could put in a, a new manifest? Do you know? Uh, what do you mean installable web app? So the, uh, the folks at like Chrome and Opera and Mozilla, um, or I guess Google and Opera and Mozilla are like looking at standards track stuff for HTML5 web applications, sort of like um, what Firefox OS did, but like the thinking is to have it more widely available. Um, like perhaps we might want a really rapid uh, mm -hmm. start screen, you know, search widget or something like that. I don't think like our um, okay. our general article experience is there yet, but like if we want to do that sort of thing, does this repo let um, us submit files? Honestly, I don't think that we ever need it because App traffic is so low, and uh, we already have one example with uh, web app that's barely ever used and just lies there, and we don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, it uh, now lies on bit.wikimedia.org that's deprecated, but because it's been uh, hardwired somewhere in my, uh, Firefox OS depth, we don't know what to do with it. We want to kill this domain, and it's kind of preventing us. Mm -hmm. So, so in principle, it's just a one HTML file that kicks you quicker to one of our projects. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We are not aiming for anything more than that. Okay. Cool. I mean, I mean, we are not, but you can borrow the repo. <laughs> and build on top of that. I mean, that's that's the nice thing about about having it on on game, right? I mean, if you if the app team can can use this code and like fork it, and then you know that that would be amazing. Or the web team. Oh, the web team, of course. Yeah. Okay.
Eric, uh, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. All right, awesome. So uh, one of the things we've been working on this quarter to uh, help support our language search goal is something called Relevance Lab. This is a way for us to uh, run a bunch of queries one way and then run them another way and then kind of compare the results and see uh, if it's different, if it's good, if it's bad, if, it's, if it does anything at all and if we should continue going down that route. Uh, we're initially using these things for, uh, for language detectors or different ways of detecting the language, like uh, using accept language headers or using a library that, uh, that does some character set stuff or a library that uses dictionaries, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't have a great demo because I hadn't prepared this, but uh, this is just a quick show of, uh, of, the, of the, the results that come out. This uh, obviously only has three queries because I ran it real quick uh, just a second ago. But uh, basically, we can define a couple query sets. Uh, we basically use a, uh, an INI file that has a, a bit of configuration, two sets of queries to run. You can set up a different configuration. Those configs are uh, they're basically just global variables to override. And uh, when you run it, it'll run both sets of queries. It'll give you, right now, we, we, it's got a very minimal uh, amount of information to it. One of the top ones we're doing right now is zero results rate because it's very easy to calculate. Uh, later on, we want to build out uh, an annotated corpus where we say things like, in the top five results for Kennedy, you should have this title, this title, and this title, or that kind of thing, and uh, to be able to generate some sort of better information. But for the moment, zero results rate. And uh, one of the things we do now, because I used roughly the same queries, I just did foo and foo star. Uh, you get a little bit of different results for them, obviously, because uh, of the words. But uh, this basically list shows us what changes actually came out of uh, of changing the search of, of changing the search or changing the search results. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically our relevancy lab. It's uh, it's fairly simple right now. Uh, but we're hoping to expand this out in, in future quarters to, to give us much more information about changes that we're making to search rather than just kind of guessing and, and hoping that something is, a, is better or worse and, and throwing it out there. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Uh, any questions? Also, add that eventually we'd love to be able to have public participation in how our relevance functions work and allow them to play with the tool like this to see if they can tweak our algorithms to be even smarter than they are right now. So, currently, it's an internal tool for the team, but eventually, I'd love to be able to host a hackathon and say, here is the best relevance function that we have with a live data set. Can you make it even better? How do you measure relevance? So, we're using a number of um, measures there from zero result for so we're using right now to weigh whether they're actually succeeding or not. So click through rate is user satisfaction. Whatever it's important is click through rate. Yeah, click through rate is hard for search results because more clicks can actually add to the result. Yes. Click through rate. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. Not easy. Okay. Any more questions? All right, uh, maybe I will switch. I'll switch to you in a second. Can you hear me? We can, just a, a moment. Um, the present to everyone feature is requiring like a toggle on and off and on. It's strange. We'll do. Yeah. Um, just a, uh, not yet, Yuri. <laughs> Is that legal? <laughs> you, you have specific. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really happy that that's not going to be part of that YouTube stream. I'm going to get a gift out of it. <laughs> All right. Ready? Not sure. Um, I'll, I'll ask Stephen if he can. Uh... Eric, see, it's quiet. <laughs> Hello. 
I'd say just get started, Yuri. Yeah. Okay. Go for All right. it. <clears throat> so a while ago, I I spoke with Thomas about uh, some of the general vision I have for Wikipedia. And uh, now there has been some conversations uh, last week, especially, about where we're going. So I decided to present my vision to a more general community. And so far, I've posted it to the internal mailing list. But actually, I'm planning to post it to the external one as well. Uh, there has been some very active responses to it. I will post. I already posted the link to the text, but I'll screen share it as well so that everyone can see it. And ooh, there it is. Uh, I dream of content is what I called it, and basically it's an idea, a very simple yet very complex to implement vision idea that we as a foundation should move towards more interactive content, uh, a way where a user that comes to a page should not feel like they're watching a TV and get fed information like they are in school, but rather interact with it, play with it, just like in a hands-on museum. Remember that staff meeting we had about a year ago? That was amazing. Everyone went to San Francisco's hands-on museum. and. It was really hard to get people back into the conference rooms because they all wanted to go out and play with stuff. And I feel that we should make Wikipedia in that image, in that route. So I, uh, I covered the uh, concept of participants and not viewers, where you can play with things, you can toggle things, you can experiment with things. I spoke, uh, briefly touched upon data and how data is critical to the success of this concept. Uh, and also uh, the concept of Wikipedia is one system. It's not a whole bunch of pages independently. And the idea here is that if pages are independent and not connected other than via simple links, then we do not capture imagination of the visit public and instead we should make Wikipedia more like uh, active, active to Facebook where people just sit there for hours and keep scrolling through the friends feed or something like that. Uh, lastly I uh, discussed briefly the fact that contributors tend to contribute in different ways uh, and some want to contribute a little piece of data, others want to contribute an image and other wants to contribute a map and generate that map and yet another group of people want to contribute a large essays. So we should uh, cater to all these groups and allow them all to be uh, not just productive, but contributing uh, and uh, beneficial to, to everyone. And now I'll take some questions. Oh, and the last, last thing, I also wrote from Dream to Reality, but that's a work in progress. That's the steps that I believe we need to take to achieve this dream. But again, this is open to discussion. There has been a lot of very positive. Um, whoops, I think I stopped my, my own presentation. That's not good. Um, that uh, uh, there was a lot of positive comments on the talk page and in the mailing list. So, but I would really love to hear negatives. I would like to hear uh, some other constructive criticisms and suggestions. Thank you. Hey, Yuri, I'll, I'll just throw out that uh, one of the strategies that the reading team is taking on moving forward or exploring is having more interactive, more interactivity uh, on, the, on the website um, and apps. Um, our focus has more been around ways that users can like, kind of engage with the content that's there in terms of like, engaging with other users or reformatting, taking content and mixing and matching it, as opposed to some of the um, more exploratory type uh, interactive graphics and stuff like games that you know you're proposing, but I think that the two are you know, like incredibly compatible. Um, so we should just talk more about that. Uh, absolutely, I I agree that b both it should be the the system itself should be more like a game. Gamification of Wikipedia has been on people's minds for the past fifteen years, I think, and also the content itself. Yes. 
So one of the so so I'm so I'm absolutely like like completely like in favor of this. That means that you know the creation should be more interactive, more fun and, and playful, etc. Right, more hands on. But one of the things that I that I uh, always get stuck with is that if we want Wikipedia to be that, then media wiki or whatever whatever the software stack is needs to needs to uh, needs to enable people to to make more interactive things. Right? It needs to not just make like text con like it just like not just enable people to put in text content but and photos, but also text content that changes over time. Uh, photos that, that that are interactive, that, that change over time, graphs and blah blah blah. Right? And uh, and I feel like so so you know and and if that is a vision that's a very and I think that's a very good vision, then you know it's a very like it, it's a pretty big effort. And I think you know some of your work to make to make graphs. Uh, you know, be more part of MediaWiki, and you know, uh, you know, goes towards that. But I think it needs needs a bigger effort to to like you know for us to like get there, right? And I think this should be a really good thing to talk about uh, to talk about at uh, at the all hands or at the uh, MediaWiki summit, right? I agree. Yes, uh, I actually spoke with Brian about this, and hopefully. We could find some time to talk about this at the Dev Summit. Um, also, I agree that this is a big effort, and well, uh, so far, uh, I mean, uh, I've been the only person working on graphs for the, for the past for for, for a while. Uh, there was only realistically two people very actively working on maps, and so yes, ob obviously, there's not enough hands to to reach all these. Dreams by ourselves. Um, one thing I do hope to achieve, though, is that um, it should be possible for a community to implement some tools that are more easily integratable into our editing environment. So that if someone comes up with a good tool, they don't need to make it a production level, and yet they can still offer a way for community to contribute that content, like 3D animations. That would some way for the we only would support playing that 3D animation, but the editing part can be kind of done by the community, or this kind of stuff. I think we had one question, and then I wanted to ask before that, though, um, I see a, a bullet point for graph extension improvement. Is that something someone's going to present, Yuri? Was that maybe you? I yeah. did not plan to okay. present this. I oh. mean, yes, it is me, but I wasn't planning to present it today. It's, I guess it's uh, Julian. OK, so uh, I think the question was from Tillman. Did you have a question? Oh, yes, on IRC. IRC, IRC, oops. What do you think is the easiest to realize? It's a pretty big version, right? And it has a pretty high price tag, I guess. Well, well, the easiest, uh, the lowest hanging fruit right now that uh, is to bring ve uh, animated Vega graphics to Wikipedia. That will, I mean, this is my work in progress. I should be done with it within the next few weeks, time permitting. Um, so that that should already introduce some animations and uh, semi-interactive features. Actually, Julian was amazing help uh, the other day uh, contributing to graph extension. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we've been trying to make it more switchable from static into a live mode, and I think that's what Julian wanted to present. Okay, cool. Uh, Julian, I will switch okay. to. I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Well, it's really more of a comment, I guess. I mean, it seems like people, you can already do all kinds of cool things using gadgets in SVG. But I think, as you remarked, it's, you, you know, you have to kind of load these gadgets. The tools are kind of you know, uh, hidden in people's personal scripts or whatever. Um, so I don't know what the solution is, but I mean, I just found trying to, trying to just have some annotated uh, elements in a picture on MediaWiki was just brutally hard. I basically couldn't do it. And yet, Clearly, people, you know, can do. There are all kinds of cool demos. So I, it seems like a big piece of this is just getting the, the scripts and gadgets sort of more known and more easy to use. But I'm sure you know that. Well, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, things that community has been able to do in a very hacky way. Unfortunately, all of them are different between different communities, which is another huge pet peeve of mine, and not just mine. Which is we have instead of having one Wikipedia. Or one wiki world, really, with wiki books and wiki voyage and everything else united. We have 
260 or 290 languages, Wikipedia <coughs> languages, and, and they're all separate, and there's no way to even use the same template cross wikis or the same Lua code, and that is very frustrating. I think one of the main things this project should do is unite communities first and help people, because then the moment we unite, then people can instantly start contributing no matter where they are in the world and what community they feel they call home. But yes, uh, the people have been very successful at creating very creative but yet hacky ways of presenting weird, you know, all sorts of data to the, to the users. Okay, well, I think one more comment, and then we should let Julian present. Yeah, um, I just wanted to call out that um, actually in the office this week is the DeepSoft student who we've given a contract to who's working on the visual editing integration draft to create any drafts directly with the visual editor. Um, sorry, louder. Louder, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, can you, can you move just a bit closer to Adam? Maybe it's really hard to hear you. Yeah, I just wanted to call out. You should probably talk to Frederick. You're having to speak in the office right now. Anyways. He, he's a GSOC student that worked on the visual editor integration for, for the graph extension. But also, okay. interwiki transclusion is something that we're probably going to start working on next quarter, which I think is a huge step towards the other issue that you were describing about right. documentation. And then just uh, transclusions, it's also Lua modules that need to be in that same scope. Yeah. No. OK, I'm going to switch over to Julian. Thanks, Yuri. Just a moment, Julian. <laughs> Yeah, YouTube open, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, just a moment, Julian. Sorry, we have to do this toggle thing again. Still eerie, huh? Yeah. Well, he's still talking. Trevor's still talking. I'm still talking. OK. Yeah, we've got this minute leg. Yeah, I think we may need to consider a different uh, tool for this. And we can always uh, export it to YouTube later. OK, it's on. So it supports it's on. MP4. It's on. OK. All right, Julian. OK. So this is just a fontaine improvement that I've done for the graph extension on my 10% research time. Um, something that I started. Uh, it was my first day with, with Fury, so I'm quite excited to work on that and to help on that. Um, but the challenge that uh, Yuri had and, and wanted to do is uh, basically uh, we either render a, a static image or we render the interactive graph with the JavaScript libraries. Uh, in, in order to that, you have to load d3.js, you have to load Vega. Uh, those are pretty big libraries, and on a very slow connection, I can take a lot of time to actually uh, render the graph, and so end up in, in not a good user experience. So uh, the suggestion from Yuri is to have basically three modes, and the first mode would be static. Graph is always an image. The second mode is click to interact. Graph starts as a static image, but can be clicked. And when you click on it, when you click on it, it turns it into an interactive graph, and it loads the JavaScript libraries only at the time. Otherwise, you can uh, choose to always render interactive. In that case, you would have to uh, load the JavaScript libraries on the first page. Um, so in practice, what that does, um, so you can put mod for static. And obviously, it's, it's just a static image. And now you can. So right now we have only two modes, and that's why your suggestion was to have like a click to interact and the other is interactive. Uh, but right now they could be. Uh, yeah, so that's 
So now it, it, it renders the same static image, uh, but I just added the make interactive button on, on the top right, and and for now like the, this design and, and how it looks is is very uh, in the early stage. Um, but you have that make interactive, and I'm sure if you hold it, it becomes um, bigger. And if you click anywhere on the on, on the graph, if we basically show loading and that and nice, actually the interactive graph uh, is uh, on my screen. Uh, to, to make it a little more obvious, I'm just going to bring the code and add a, a, like a three seconds delay to the graph loading, so you could eventually see how it would do on the slow connection. So that's it. Basically, like doing the, the, the three seconds of loading, which is a little loading message on that space, like you can, and you can obviously trade on, on all of that signing. Um, but what, what's really interesting is, is also in the network, because you can see that right now it's just a static image, and it's going to load the additional JavaScript uh, that is needed to, to run the page. All right. Uh, so there are still some improvements that we do. Um, we actually like uh, have the all the data of the graph on the first load, and we don't need that. So we should make it a probably an API call when you click on the graph to first get the data of the graph and to then later on another the graph. Uh, so still a lot of improvements uh, to do, but just a step forward that I wanted to to show you. Here. <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. Does anybody have any questions? So uh, I just want uh, just to hint that um, uh, we would probably want to do the same thing for maps later uh, with rendering static maps, and mm -hmm. then on the end, when you click on it, it will become an interactive map. Otherwise, learning would be too expensive. Okay. Do, do we have any uh, thoughts towards detecting IP or knowing something about IP so that we can, uh, or about bandwidth connection so we can decide based on that? Um, that would be on my scope. Probably Yuri uh, might have more answers. I'm, I'm really uh, <laughs> that project. Okay. So there's a, uh, there's a um, MaxMind library that I believe Oliver has built a wrapper around that you can actually use to see what kind of connection um, the what kind of connection that the library thinks that IP is IP has. That's pretty should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, it might not be super reliable, but it's ninety percent in the US, but much less than the country it's not. What are you asking? One of the boundaries of the uh, other than using in the sense of uh, graphs. So can you do all kinds of graphs or creating as a number? Or is it like, I mean, you can see very far, like a very. Yeah, this is very simple. Uh, I know that Yuri had to upgrade it to the latest version of Vega. Um, I mean, te te technically, you can do any kinds of graph in Vega. There's a Vega editor if you go to their uh, yeah. GitHub page, it's not seeing what you also do. Okay. And you can really do all kinds of graph. Cool. So, so this is really cool. I'm just like, and I, this is like a bigger general question to like, to like everybody in this room, like like how do we think we can we can like get users to make content like this? Right? Like how can we like how can we get our editors to make like not just graphs but like interactive graphs, right? Because we're basically asking them to like to like be these like interactive designers now. Right? You know, figure out like interactions on upon these like little like you know widgets, right? And and that's a really tricky question for me. I don't know how to like answer this. Yuri, can you talk a little bit about the projects that have really embraced graph. I know Hungarian with P especially has surfaced a lot of them. I think Yuri actually dropped okay. off the line. I think there's not really like like I don't think we have to solve this problem universally. I don't think every editor needs to be able to create interactive graphs. Yeah. I think actually we can just we can have like a brown bag and show people you have an edit on or something because it's like remarkable how much work is done by how you 
So from, from my from my personal experience with uh, being a contributor, um, what helped me a lot? I want to do all kinds of crazy stuff. If I have like a, if I have like a template okay. that I can refer to, and that was like the big first step. If I if there's some, a best practice or so, I'm like yes, yeah. okay, and now I can do I can copy that and, and remix it for sure. So so like better documentation, like data and developer hub kind of thing. But I think the template thing is a crutch. Like we're at for a time, although let's let's wrap up. And I think Curry has, like, Curry has one comment. The reason that people use templates, which is great, is for uniformity, which is exactly what you said. But, okay. but all we have to all you have to do is especially reverse engineer the whole process and just say like what they really want to be able to do is just provide really basic pieces of information and have everything else work in a uniform way. And that's the thing is like we don't really want all, everyone to be interaction designers. What we want people to do is be able to provide the data. And the semantic information that's required, so that we can ensure that all the graphs render in, in a consistent way, and then we can adapt the graphs for different devices. Because we, we really don't want to give them like robust detail tools. We want to give them the ability to fill out a simple form, and that's what templates give them, and that we should follow. Okay. Apologies, I switched to YouTube and did not realize it was like 10 or 15 seconds behind. <laughs> so. Uh, at the moment I heard Yuri, I switched back, but then it's like, oh, wait. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, I, I overheard that. Uh, I didn't hear the last 10, 20 seconds of conversation. Um, I understood that, um, yes, the templates, I think, is the way to solve the, um, the inconsistencies between graphs. There will always be uh, very tech-savvy users uh, in the community that will design prototypes for complex graph interactions. And then there will always be users who do not know programming as well, who will just want to supply specific data for specific use case for specific articles, and they will fill that graph. Uh, this has already happened, actually. The German Wikipedia um, developer created a um, uh, community developer. It created a, a template for very complex charts and um, made it as a template with tons of different parameters. And users have been using that to simply insert what's needed. As far as interactions, uh, well, there, first of all, uh, uh, there's also uh, complex Vega tools to draw graphs, to like uh, design graphs. And uh, I think we should we should we should work on build, bringing them to WMF Labs uh, and integrating them somehow into an editing process where community members can easily go there and use those tools to design graphs. And uh, lastly, um, there, the um, animation is also something that will be available soon. And I think uh, for that, again, you'll need a developer-like mindset to set it up, and then community will fill them up. I hope I answered any of the missing questions. Yeah, and I, I think that was really helpful. Thanks, Yuri. Um